Welcome everyone, very glad to see a full room. Um, this is Ernesto, I think everyone knows Ernesto <laughs> from the WHO, I don't think we need any introduction. My oh name come on, I'm not that famous. <laughs> yes you are, <laughs> but maybe you can give a very yeah. brief... Uh, yeah, well welcome to the session, I am Ernesto Ramillo, I work with the Global TV program in WHO in Geneva, responsible for uh, policy issues mostly related with NDR TV, but because NDR TV is a kind of meeting point of the complexity of the TV strategy, that means I have also to do with quite a few cross-cutting issues, including patient support, patient centered care, uh, and all those related topics. Okay. My name is Susan Pendenhoff, I work for KNCP to the Closest Foundation in the Netherlands. And again, welcome to this session uh, about uh, effectiveness and obstacles for social support for uh, TB patients. So, um, Ernesto already mentioned patient-centered care, very important to help patients overcome psychological, social and financial uh, issues encountered during TB diagnosis and treatment. Uh, and during this session we have six presentations. Uh, we will learn about the history and future of social support guidelines, uh, the outcomes of two systematic reviews relevant to patient uh, care and support, um, we will hear from uh, the health provider side about obstacles to provision of social support to patients and we will hear from two patients um, who have overcome pre-XDR and XDR and we are very happy that they are here to share with us their experiences. So I think we should start with the first presentation. Thank you. So. This uh, uh, fir first presentation, w uh, we want to share with you what is the, the kind of global perspective in which we are anchoring this uh, social support concept and, and social protection. So, uh, yes, thank you. I declare no conflict of interest. This is the most complex slide of all presentations, <laughs> right? Because I think that we all have all kind of interest. That's why we are here. If we have zero interest to declare, we were probably in the Beatles Museum. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is one of the most painful images I have seen this year, apart from those coming from the war. Uh, this gentleman, the lady next to him, the small girl, is his daughter. And what he's carrying on his shoulder is the corpse of his wife, who has just passed away three hours before in a small facility in his country. And she passed away of tuberculosis. And he had to make the decision to take the body, the corpse of his wife, on his shoulders and walk 26 kilometers back to his village to start the funeral and give the burial. So big question, what means social support, patient-centered care? in the response to TV and NDR TV when you are facing realities like this, right? So people are so poor that even for a painful moment like this, they are alone. So we talk about TV, to our closest people are sick with TV, we need new tools, new diagnostic, new vaccines, new uh, treatment. But at the end of the day, this is the reality that pay the people when there are new tools still available who could have prevented this, this reality. So the new NTV strategy has three pillars and they are underpinned by core principles. One of them is ensuring sound ethics and protection and promotion of human rights and equity. All tends to be seen as blah, 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 philosophy. Oh, people devote full life to these speeches, right? But how this can be converted into concrete action in the field that can ensure that people like this person feel the support of the society even when we have to face death. So pillar one talks about integrating patient-centered care. But patient-centered care, again, because it's less tangible than extra. In extra, you have the coffee machine. Oh, yes, you have the treatment outcome data. They all, oh, the medical is working. But patient-centered care, the indicators are still a bit in the air, a bit cheesy. Patient-centered care, as defined in this document, 
produce in one of the projects or funded by USAID to the CPA is nothing different than to ensure that there is respect for patients' rights, preferences, values, and needs. But uh, the health system usually don't pay too much attention to the needs and values of the patient. There are not even very good validated tools about how to assess, how to determine what are those needs, what are those values, and how can the system be responsive to those values and not the other way around, that the patient have to be responsive to the needs of the healthcare system. So unlike the usual thing in, 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 in research in which ethics has to catch up, right? There is now the editing of the genome, but there is not yet, well, there is now a, de a debate about what is the implications of editing uh, uh, the, the genome, right? Uh, but it's usually a catch up playing, a game played by, by the ethics expert. It's very interesting that in TV, we have the ethics guidance in 2010 saying very clearly that uh, DOT, supervision of treatment, in the absence of patient centered care, is unethical. Is unethical. So basically, saying that patient-centered care cannot be an option, but a must, as important as the medicines when the services are taking care of, of mounting a proper response to tuberculosis. So this guidance on ethics has actually been updated, and there was a workshop earlier this week to discuss details about this. Is highlighting all these normative aspects. But still, when it comes to the factual data about what to do, we are limited by some collection of best experiences that were put together in the companion handbook. Just trying to fill that gap, we decided then to say, yes, fine to have normative guidance, fine to have nice collection of good practices, but can we do a systematic review of the evidence? Then WHO, for the very first time, has embarked and conducted a systematic review on the evidence on DOT and the modalities of surveillance of adherence to treatment, because we have to go beyond that fixed con a concept of DOT, and what are the best ways that have shown in a systematic review of the evidence to make the difference in social support. WHO has a very well established process for, produce, for, system, for reviewing evidence and grading that evidence for the sake of informing policy. This is published in the literature and for the sake of time, you know that we started three, three, four minutes late because of a technical hiccup. I will go to skip this, but just to go straight away to say that we are in the process well advanced of grading the evidence on the different varieties of social support. Social support is a concept well established in social sciences, in social psychology, in sociology, in social work, consisting of three elements, education and information, psychological support, emotional support, and material support that could be in kind or in services. Material support is what quite often programs are doing nowadays, food vouchers, uh, food baskets, uh, transport vouchers, or services that could be universal access to healthcare, right? So that comes under material support, but the package as a whole is called social support. So we structure a pick of question that try to encapsulate all the different varieties in which different, different models of so doing surveillance for adherence to treatment. Could be video observed therapy, could be direct observation of therapy at a facility level, at home base, a, 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 with a home base approach, and with different actors. So applying all the criteria well established by Prisma, a systematic review was commissioned and conducted by a group of researchers <coughs> from the University of California in San Francisco. Uh, we structured this type of interventions. And then quarter one coming here, we are expecting to have an updated set of recommendations about how, what to do, and how to do social support as an expression of what it means to have a patient-centered approach. <coughs> There are gaps in the evidence because, for example, <coughs> everybody talk, uh, talks about stigma. I was in, in, a, pre in a workshop, a, in a symposium, uh, the previous symposium somewhere, in which it's very clear that everybody talks about stigma, but nobody is measuring it because there are not a tool. There is not. There are no tools validated and that can really uh, be widely utilized. And there are no interventions that have been also well identified, validated, or how to address the stigma. So it becomes like a theological thing, religious thing. Everybody talks about it, but nobody has seen it, right? 
uh, ha has uh, the mean how to, to address that. I just want to share this uh, slide with some of the findings of the systematic review. M my colleague Susan is going to present that in more detail in her presentation, but the systematic review is showing very clearly that you can find higher rate of treatment success, lower rate of loss to follow up when you have supervision of treatment with interventions that consist of packages of social support. Meanwhile, you can also have higher treatment success, lower rates of uh, loss to follow up when you have mid combination vis a vis when you compare that with just self administration or just direct observation of treatment. In short, patient support with a patient-centered approach, social support interventions is what makes the difference per se, it's not the DOT alone, which confirms the normative guidance on ethics. Doing DOT in the absence of patient-centered care is just unethical, right? So we are now in the last stages. This is going to be uh, submitted to the report and this is the monthly review to the Guidance Review Committee, and hopefully we are going to be able to update the guidance not even to update the guidance, to produce the very first concrete guidance out of a proper review of the evidence on the place that this kind of intervention have. And it's hopefully to enable Global Fund to be in a more comfort comfortable position to take stock of the resources they are all, uh, mobilizing to support countries to ensure that patients are really at the center of the response and that we don't limit ourselves just to put pills in the mouth or call examples for a gene expert, but also to address the reality that patients with tuberculosis are living in, which is a reality far more complex than just the biomedic the biomedical aspects that we try to cover with treatment and that are addressed in the treatment guidelines. This is a complex exercise in which many players have been contributing and making an effort, and I would like just to finalize rescuing the uh, uh, comment of a patient who has survived in DRTV and who insists it was just published in BBC a couple of months ago. Had not been because of the support of my mom and the support of my husband, I would not be able to, to survive. So that is probably the essence of the patient center approach and social support. Yes, new tools are very important, are crucial, are essential, but may not be sufficient in the vast majority of patients that are in need of our system. So uh, with this, I would like to introduce my co-chair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susan van den Hoff is working in KNCB and has been the leading force behind us. one of the systematic reviews that have been recently conducted on the place that social support intervention have in the response to MDRTV and to tuberculosis in general. Susan. Maybe while I start up, <laughs> maybe if there's any questions for Ernesto. Okay, question, comments, while Susan uh, upload the presentation. Yes, uh, Darcy. So I, I would just like to go back and, and disagree a little bit about the notion that patient-centered care isn't well-defined. Because if you look at any of the nursing literature from time immemorial, this is what nurses do, is nursing case management. And there is a vast body of literature that defines quite clearly eight different realms of patient-centered care that should be attended to if you're providing proper health care to a patient, whether it's a TB patient, whether it's a diabetes patient, any patient on the planet. So I think that we do have a lot to work with, and I think that nurses actually have a lot to contribute to this process. Absolutely. And when I began with that provoca provocative statement, was just to highlight that definition I put there. What That's patient an IOM definition. Is. Right? Yeah. Because <coughs> at the end of the day, as Darcy is highlighting very clearly, these are very much issues related with care, which are the speciality of the nurses, and where by the biomedical approach we have had for many years to TB has been kind of sidelined because the emphasis has been put on treatment. While for care, there is a very well established definition, not only of social support, but what patient centered care means. And that's why we need to accelerate the effort to get everybody speaking the same language, such a way these tools that are available on the Global Fund scheme to support and to fund can be available to, to patients. Okay. I hope you also can see the screen.
screen, otherwise you just have to look on the laptop. It's <laughs> getting full, and we were happy with, uh, full with this, such a big audience. Um, so as uh, Anessa mentioned, I will talk about a systematic review that we did uh, last year on the effects of patient support and treatment, outcomes and treatment adherence. Um, so as a background, I don't think I need to tell you, but I will tell you anyhow. Uh, <laughs> what are the reasons for incomplete treatment adherence? Uh, first of all, of course, long treatment duration for TB and especially for MDR TB. Well, especially for drug sensitive TB, many patients quickly improve on symptoms early during their treatment period. Um, so they feel less the need to complete treatment, while at the same time, the adverse drug reactions are appearing when you, um, while you are longer on treatment. And in addition, of course, there's the financial burden and stigma also may play a role in um, not completing treatment. Uh, so social support interventions um, are being provided in many countries, but maybe not to all patients. In many countries, there's something in place for mdr to be patients, but not for all to be patients. And it's not really ingrained in the national TB uh, program yet. Um, and there w there's really uncertainty about the contribution of these social support interventions <coughs> on treatment adherence and treatment outcomes. And that's why we did a systematic literature review. It was published recently in uh, PLOS One. Uh, and the objective was to uh, identify uh, which <coughs> social support interventions are being provided uh, and described in the literature, and what were the, their effects on treatment adherence and treatment outcomes. So we, we um, took into account two types of social support, um, psycho-emotional support, that's really emotional support through psychological interventions like counseling or TB clubs for, uh, for TB patients, and socio-economic support, which is really material support, tangible support. Um, delivering services for patients, helping them, for example, with a registration, with getting access to any uh, financial um, um, uh, services that are uh, available, um, and maybe, uh, or food packages, for example. So we uh, looked at the effects on treatment adherence and outcomes, and we, we actually also wanted to look uh, over what were the effects on the financial burden. But unluckily, there was really hardly any data available that we could include in our, uh, in our uh, systematic review. So we did a review um, on at about 25 years uh, in, in the literature. Um, and we included studies that looked at treatment that was provided at least partially uh, during uh, outpatient treatment because most of the patient support is needed while patients are released from the hospital. Um, and, and we in included those studies where we could make a comparison between those patients who got an intervention or a package of interventions and patients where that did not. So we uh, identified many abstracts, uh, went through all of them, uh, and in the end, we could only include 25 studies uh, that we described, and we included 21 of them in a meta-analysis, where we really pulled the data in a quantitative analysis. So 11 of those 25 studies were randomized clinical trials, and 11 were non-randomized studies. Uh, only three of these studies were done in low-income countries, and most of them were done in uh, middle-income countries and most um, patients that contributed to this uh, meta-analysis <coughs> were from Brazil, China, Russia, South Africa, uh, and Senegal, so mostly BRICS countries. Uh, 11 of the 25 studies uh, were, were on socioeconomic support interventions, uh, seven on psycho, psychological, psycho-emotional uh, support intervention, and seven um, provided a, a combination of those two. Uh, so the, the studies uh, differed in size, some were very small, included only 46 patients in total, but the biggest one included more than 4,000 patients in total. So what were the results? Um, I think it's a bit small for you all to see, but <laughs> I will try to uh, 
Um, so this is one, so this means there is no effect of the intervention on treatment success, while everything on the right side means that there is a positive effect. Uh, so there's better treatment success uh, when the patients were supported with, uh, were provided with um, social support. And here, the, the top three studies looked at psycho-emotional support. The lower uh, five looked at socio-economic support. And here there's uh, three that looked at the combination. And what you see is that all of them, uh, or almost all of them, showed a significant improvement of treatment success for the patients that were provided with social support interventions. Um, we also looked at the effect on unsuccessful treatment outcomes. And of course, there's overlap in the studies that were uh, included in this analysis, but also there were additional studies uh, included. And here you should, so that uh, here again, the, the line here means there's no effect and everything on the left side of that line <coughs> means that there are less patients with an unsuccessful treatment outcome. And also here you see that most studies showed that there was an effect and there were less patients with unsuccessful treatment outcomes. Um, when we looked at treatment adherence, there were actually there were only three randomized clinical trials that uh, looked at that, and um, two of them didn't show an ex uh, didn't show a significant improvement in treatment adherence of the social support interventions, while one did. So there's really not a lot of evidence out there. As Ernesto mentioned, um, WHO has commissioned a broader systematic review uh, on the effects of social support interventions. This was done by the University of San Francisco. San Francisco. Um, and they really, they, um, they confirmed the findings of our smaller uh, review. Um, so material support uh, was associated with higher treatment success a higher sputum conversion and lower rates of mortality, treatment failure, and loss to follow up. Patient education and counseling also was associated with higher uh, treatment success rates. And psychological support also was associated with higher treatment completion rates and lower rates of treatment failure and loss to follow up. So these results are all um, fresh. And they will be included in the in the updated guidelines. Here. So, in conclusion, um, there's there is evidence that social support is important, that it does help to improve uh, treatment outcomes. Um, there's little evidence on the effects on treatment adherence, but on the other side, treatment adherence is an intermediate goal to the ultimate aim of treatment uh, success. Uh, and there really is no evidence on um, uh, what is the effect on really reducing the financial burden. So that is uh, important to get uh, better uh, data on. Um, most supports <coughs> were really giving different types of, um, of support. So it's, it's not really <coughs> possible to tease out the effects of the individual uh, interventions. Uh, but on the other hand, I also think most patients need um, a combined package of intervention, not just one. So the quality of the evidence was really rated as very low, um, which means that the results should be interpreted with caution, but on the other hand, the, the results are very consistent. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't need more well-designed studies. Uh, and also, it would be very helpful if programs that are providing support to patients also monitor and evaluate the effects of that. And um, lastly, um, it's also very important to get more data on the efficiency. What is the cost effectiveness of providing different sorts of social support? Because we all know that um, the budgets are not unlimited. Uh, so we have to come up with, with um, those interventions <coughs> that are 
um, working, um, and but also are affordable to the programs and the countries. So I would like to thank my um, fellow uh, uh, authors and also Lynn from the WHO. Uh, and um, if there's any questions, I would be happy to uh, take them. Many. <laughs> <laughs> yes, presentation. Uh, uh, so I'm A. L. Lauren from the United States, and uh, I guess um, so. I really appreciate you doing this work. I think it's a very important step to try to characterize the lack of diversity and quality. One thing that um, I would kind of beg us all to think about is to get outside of the biomedical framework here, which is that we're still looking at treatment completion as a primary outcome. And if you look at broader literature, I'm, you know, the asthma field or other other respiratory areas. I think it's really important to think about what social support does, and we can think about a lot of coping, anxiety, stress, depression. So I think I don't think the literature is there, right? It's but I think true. we really yeah. need to be thinking about what are the these immediate downstream effects. And of course, as the TV pulmonologists in the room or something, we want to know how it's affecting the, the treatment completion. Um, but on that regard, I also think it's important to think more broadly beyond just TV-based interventions. In other words. You know, right now, I don't know, mindfulness is a hot topic. I'm not saying it necessarily works in all contexts, but I don't think to affect, to increase social support or to increase the ability to cope, you need to have TV-specific interventions, and they may actually shift the needle on TV-specific outcomes. So. Yeah, um, you mentioned, uh, thank you again, I'm fascinated by this area. I've worked in many different settings on adherence, and I am, again, as an anthropologist, I'm interested in the, the context specific support, what, what kind of support matters for whom and at what point in the trajectory. So I know you said it's very difficult to tease out the effects because it's a systematic yes. review and you have a limited number of studies, but I wondered whether both of you could share your perspective on the relative importance of socioeconomic support versus what's called psycho, psychosocial or psycho-emotional, and also the relative the, the, the relative weight of community-based or family support versus clinic-based, because again, I think it's so highly dependent on the setting, and I know that's never helpful to just say context matters, but it would be nice to hear. Yeah, so we, as you saw, the, the number of studies really are small, so we really, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't make those those comparisons or, or look at those um, things. I, I mean, I have a personal uh, opinion, which is that you re it should be patient-centered, so you should look at what the patient needs. And that can be very different um, per patient, even within the same setting. So I don't think there's a one-fits-all answer here, but I appreciate um, yeah, what you're saying. Fully agree. Shall we move to the next speaker? I think I think we should just to <laughs> make sure that we give everyone enough time. Yeah, we will we we, we will have um, a general discussion at the end. Hopefully, yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Susan. <laughs> so uh, Sinaida uh, Abuloeva is uh, our colleague from Tajik Tajikistan, uh, working with KNC <coughs> and supporting the implementation of the NTV strategy, and will be sharing with us uh, her experience dealing with the obstacles in the delivery of social support uh, through the health system. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for you and for organizers of this nice conference. To have an opportunity to present here uh, healthcare work ex experience on provision uh, psychosocial support for TB patients in Tajikistan. And my colleagues also thought I have no any interest that, uh, related to this prese uh, presentation. About a little bit about Tajikistan. Uh, Tajikistan is a small country, and uh, yeah, Tajikistan is a landlocked country in the Central Asia, and 93% of our country is uh, uh, covered by mountains. Uh, Tajikistan borders uh, with China, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Afghanistan, and the population of Tajikistan is around 8 million people. And our population is below poverty line, fortunately, 35 and 5 person, estimated that of 2014. And nas national TV budget is around uh, 29 US million dollars, but only 25 person is covered by government, domestic. 75 person is uh, donors, um, and other sources. 
a little bit about burden. Uh, Tajikistan is among 80 TB high priority countries um, in uh, of WHO European region, and TB incidence is 87 per 100,000 million. Uh, mm -hmm. so per per uh, uh, Tajikistan belongs to 25 high priority burden uh, in DR TB countries wo uh, worldwide, and uh, DR. Uh, the incidence is 22 per 100,000 uh, people. The fungicide resistance is 14% um, among new cases and 76 among previously treated uh, TB cases. There is estimated 1,300 uh, refund resistant TB cases. Uh, they are among 4,799 notified pulmonary TB cases. Actually, uh, it was diagnosed uh, 729, of whom, of whom there is 54 XDR TB patients. DR uh, TB treatment success uh, from uh, 2013 cohort is, was uh, 16%. A little bit about TB care model in Tajikistan. Uh, our patient uh, model was start since 2015 in Tajikistan, and TB services, uh, TB care is provided by TB services and the primary health services facilities. TB services is responsible for diagnostic and case management, and PHC is responsible for referral and uh, um, detection, as well as for DOT. In Tajikistan, the same treatment is intensive phase and continuation phase. And after two, three months, as usual, in the hospital, staying in the hospital, the patient usually uh, continue the treatment at home and ambulatory uh, level as outpatient patients. But some of patients are started immediately uh, uh, refuse hospitalization and start at home, like in the ambulatory, ambulatory model uh, uh, level. It's depend on the social uh, economic problem. As uh, Susan uh, already talked about psycho emotional uh, psycho uh, social support, this PCC um, uh, support was implemented uh, in Tajikistan uh, in the 20 pilot districts since 2015. And PCC, psychosocial support mechanism, established that involves local authorities, TB services, PHC, and community. Healthcare um, providers identify the patient who is in need for psychosocial support, and they submit the list request to the local authorities. They, there is, uh, in the uh, Tajikistan, uh, uh, majority population of Tajikistan, they are living in the rural area. 70% 70, 70 of uh, population in their state and the rural base. That's why in the rural uh, level, we have um, one, how to say, the team group who identify the um, to be uh, patients who is in need for psychosocial support. This team consists from health workers, uh, community leaders, and also local village uh, authorities. And they uh, use uh, this criteria, who is in need, who is eligible for, for psychosocial support. And they use the criteria poor, severe side effects, secondary chronic diseases, uh, and the point for the treatment interruption or with like we to default. Local authorities, they include these patients who is in need, who is eligible, uh, into the existing benefit package. In the Tajikistan, it's only three years, the, they use, uh, the, the benefit package consists of uh, local authorities together with um, uh, local um, uh, leaders. They, uh, they, uh, uh, this uh, benefits its exemption from electricity payment, uh, water sanitation payment, taxation of the land, for example, the, the, the patient are free from the payment, but only in the period of the treatment. 
or, uh, or for example, um, some district allocated funds to, to cover the transportation uh, costs. Some of the, the some of districts uh, mm, they uh, mm, provide land <coughs> for the kitchen garden uh, for the, the for their livelihood and also provide the homes. Also, psychological uh, psychosocial support uh, it established also through the uh, department of religion. This department of religion leaders and the uh, local uh, authorities and the local commands. And um, uh, in the district, for example, there is a lot of mosques, and some of the mosques are uh, they have official official uh, status, <coughs> and they um, have a lot of charities, and also our health worker to get the TB service in PHC, they identify the patients, uh, uh, especially the RTB patients, and they uh, prepare the uh, request and submit to the Department of Religious Leaders, and they can see how much and how many patients they can provide the charity, Zakat. There is a stable, uh, table, but uh, okay. two years working, 2014 and 2015, there is DSTB patients, and this column is uh, DRTB patients. It is compared. The green column is the patient who was registered, for example, 2014, and among uh, uh, about 1,500, uh, 1, this green column. The red column is the patient who is eligible for psychosocial support, and the blue one who really received in 2000, uh, who really received psychosocial support in 2014. And you can compare in this 2015, the same, the social support was double increased. And the same in the, for a refund PC resistant TB patients. If you can see 2014, it's 15. 2015, it's already uh, more than 100 patients. In my, in my presentation, it's very short, but I can't say that, okay, psychosocial support is not too easy like this presentation, slide by slide. We have a lot of challenges also. First of all, it's in insufficient government budget. I already mentioned in the first slide that only 25% of the budget, 29 million years old, is covered by country. We are depends of donors. Poor infrastructure, poor TB infrastructure, poor uh, infection control measure, and the facilities and also at the uh, at home of the patients. High turnover of healthcare providers because of low motivation, low salary, low working condition. There is also social selling challenges in Tajikistan. Poverty is high, high migration, um, international and, uh, internal and external, high number of low, uh, lost follow-up, I mean defaulters. Low TB detection rate is composed for the limited access to the culture testing, especially for the second uh, line drugs, uh, and only 36% estimated from 2015. Patient certain approach and social support services are still limited only in the 20 pilot districts in one third of the country. Tajikistan consists from the 65 districts, and only one third is covered by psychosocial support. And a little bit about lessons learned. We can say a lot because it's only two years we are working. Uh, but but we can mention this that even uh, with uh, even uh, the second even heaven. Wait, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Please continue. Oh. Okay. Uh, with good advocacy and uh, with good uh, negotiation, health worker can this way can insist. It can provide uh, interest of TB patient interest in the high level, and high level authority. Then they can turn turn to this problem. They can they can reflect. They can take actions. It means that uh, um, um, local authorities. Of course, in Tajikistan, they have national national TB program. They have law of TB issues. But uh, you know, at the local uh, level, 
the authorities is so busy with other problems, they have this, they, sh they should to solve another, but this, uh, the health worker, with good advocacy, with, uh, with good preparing, they can, um, uh, uh, how to say, they can, they can um, real uh, improve uh, the knowledge and also the uh, local authority can understand how its, how its uh, main uh, topic is to be reduction in disease uh, on their day level. Even having limited fund, uh, the mechanism uh, we developed, uh, developed is sustainable because I already mentioned that we have the national TV program and the law of the TV, uh, TV uh, the, these um, documents are approved by um, government, by president, but at the local level, we also, together this uh, health worker, can persuade the local authority to issue another district level order to, to um, uh, through this, this order, it, uh, it will sustain, sustain the good collaboration be, uh, between PHC, TB facilities, and local authority to to in, to improve to improve detection, symptom transportation, and also to provide through this lo local order to provide um, psychosocial support to the patient who is in need, mm -hmm. and stigma also reduce um, uh, through the awareness on the TB problems and efforts of health providers to look for the support and openly advocate to patient interest. What I want to say uh, uh, today before, in the first day of the conference, our colleagues from Latvia Liga, uh, the her presentation was uh, finished by very nice words. I'm just repeat this. If you really want to do something, you will find a way. If you don't want, you find only an excuse. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, oh, maybe, maybe we can person still have uh, a question. We can allow for one, one question. Or two. Or two, <laughs> if they're short. Um, I just want to, I'm trying to get to grips with what the nature of the intervention is. It's this slippery concept of you know psychological intervention. Is it? Is there a philosophy underpinning it? Is it the same? Uh, people trained to deliver it. Is it the same for each patient? When we talk about psychological support, what a, what actually is it? Can we see it and name it and feel it? It's a bit like you know talking about mindfulness as one approach. What what actually happens to a patient? What's going on with the psychological support? The psycho uh, about the psycho psychological support. Huh? I already told that uh, our country is uh, poor, yeah. But with good advocacy interest, we can uh, uh, the, the the local authorities, Kukuma, they allocate special. They have uh, they have lines special social support in the budget with the budget on the district level, and with good advocacy, this this budget is for example. To, for building of the uh, some hospital to uh, to root the road to plant the tree, but with good intervention, with good advocacy, we can show and can explain to the to the local. If I don't understand right your your question, I, I think the question was more on the psychological psychological, support. psychological or social. What, what, what therapeutically? Is what are that the interventions? Then? What's yeah. the intervention? that's going on between the worker what is the service and delivery and the, the healthcare worker and the patient uh, oh. okay the health uh, health worker uh, health worker this is this is this um, presentation is uh, only like s uh, small experience of the health worker what the health worker can do they they in this presentation i want to, to show how health worker uh, with good advocacy can show in the very high level the TB, uh, TB patient interest if, uh, ex exactly for the providing of sci uh, psychological or and, and uh, social support. They, you know uh, how important for the TB patient to have some small support to, to keep them in the treatment and to increase the ad uh, uh, adherence for the treatment. And this uh, for example, during uh, uh, psychological, uh, uh, social, during the, the, the treatment, to keep them, 
they they uh, they they are free from pay for payment of the for water for electricity and other. But psychological, we don't have really in Tajikistan a lot of uh, TB uh, the nurses uh, uh, or doctors who is psychologists. But we are trained the religion leaders and a very active uh, community members. Very basic basic skills on providing consulting. For example. Uh, even for, for to, to refer the, pa the patient uh, who is uh, suspect for TB. Um, sorry for my English, maybe I didn't understand a little bit what you want, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You can, you can have a separate yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. discussion uh, yeah, yeah. afterwards if you still have a question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next presentation is by Nina Sommerveld, who uh, also did a systematic review uh, on the effectiveness of interventions to reduce TB stigma. Yes. So, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. No. Uh, I, I, your name is Nina Sommerland, not Sommerveld. Yeah, <laughs> I, for some reason, it doesn't sound like it's a very difficult last name, but for some reason it tends to be. Uh, um, it tends to be so yeah as uh, we've heard before by the way it's very nice to see so many faces that I don't recognize actually it's so nice to reach out to new audiences too and um, yeah as we have talked about stigma is a, is a big problem uh, for uh, TB patients and uh, we um, and it's very important to reduce stigma. And to do this, we uh, did uh, we conducted a systematic literature review to find the uh, interventions uh, that were evaluated that would say something about effective uh, ways to uh, reduce this. Uh, yes. No. Um, so about tuberculosis and, and stigma, it ha TB has, as you may know, like a long uh, history of stigma. And it has changed during the time and different places. And uh, it tends to be at some point associated with something negative apart from the actual disease. And uh, these days is often um, uh, with the TB and HIV co-infection, sometimes a double stigma with TB, which has a, uh, it can be um, targeted in a different way sometimes than when it's only a TB stigma. And uh, why are we doing this? Because uh, stigma causes a lot of social suffering and isolation, first of all. It causes very much suffering for people. It also uh, can result in a delay in seek uh, seeking treatment and also a reduction in the adherence to treatment because often uh, if something is uh, very socially stigmatized, there a, a lot of patients want to hide their their illness and uh, thus um, not disclose to uh, to other people. And just TB stigma, as I said, can be related to uh, different things depending on time and place. And uh, stigma uh, that is what stigma is. It's when something um, such as an illness as TB is associated with other traits that are considered negative, whether they might be true or not. Um, for example, poverty um, stigma is, uh, TB is often associated with poverty. The majority of people suffering from TB um, live in poverty, but it's also something that becomes a stigmatized tra um, trait. Also, dirtiness and poor hygiene has been something that TB has been uh, associated with through time and still is in certain circumstances. And uh, it has been thought before that uh, TB is actually caused by dirtiness, and, uh, which is, of course, wrong. And uh, in some contexts, it's also viewed, it can be viewed as a punishment from uh, higher powers. Um, it can be viewed like the whole family might be cursed because TB, TB might be occurring in whole families because they live closely together. And also it's, uh, it can be associated with so-called immoral behavior 
when it's um, associated also with uh, HIV and uh, then it's mainly uh, extramarital sexual affairs that is, it can be associated with. And this can vary from different countries and different con contexts. So we did this review and we asked whether certain interventions are effective in reducing TB stigma and we focused then on evaluation and um, somewhat evidence-based studies. So there were um, a lot in the literature that could describe, not a lot, but there were uh, described interventions and described social support for uh, TB patients, but they were they didn't really say anything about whether they were effective. We didn't show that in some kind of scientific way. Um, and we focused on the study population of the general community, healthcare workers, and people with TB. Because as I'm a sociologist, um, I also believe that stigma is something that is created in society in the general community as well. And comes from somewhere. It doesn't only automatically occur these feelings in an individual who happens to have TB. So we also focus on um, intervention that try to decre decrease stigma in other people towards uh, people with uh, TB. And we made a really comprehensive search actually. We searched eight, da uh, eight databases. Uh, scientific databases, we also did refer uh, reference tracking and um, looked at reports and uh, uh, yeah, uh, various uh, sources. And through this, we uh, screened over 4,000 titles and abstract and we made a, in the, in our search terms, we include, we um, thought that it, the title did not have to include stigma specifically, but we looked other for other proxies as well, such as attitudes and um, self-efficacy and patience and so on, so we really looked at a lot. But in the end, what we found, even though we had uh, uh, quite a, we didn't just look for controlled randomized trials, which is considered like the higher, highest evidence, but we only find s found seven studies in the end. And um, these uh, studies were from uh, between 99 and 2015. We actually searched from, uh, two th uh, from 1950. And um, those were from um, six different countries. There are uh, um, two from uh, uh, Peru. There it looks like one almost, but they were in the same place. And um, to I'm going to go through the results based on um, population um, that they are um, that were targeted to uh, where to reduce stigma. And um, I'm starting with uh, people with TB or TB patients. And if you reduce stigma in those, it, you talk about internalized stigma. When, which is when uh, a TB patient is uh, believed to uh, have these, these negative traits or some of these negative traits that uh, TB can be associated with. And uh, this can lead to um, <coughs> isolation and lower self-efficacy and so on, and all just uh, yeah, social suffering in general. And we found uh, as uh, you talked about, um, patient-centered care as a, as a method in community nursing where then trained nurses were um, meeting patients and uh, having uh, counseling sessions, and also, which also included home visits to really take into account the, specific, the needs of the specific patient. For example, look at the housing conditions, is there a family? What are the family family relations and so on? And try to shift the usual power hierarchy a bit from where the as the, I think uh, uh, Anessa were talking about that the patients are are meant to comply to the healthcare workers' needs um, and to try to shift that to uh, give the patient more uh, more power and self-efficacy. 
to also reduce this, there were um, examples in, for example, uh, yeah, Ethiopia, Peru, and Nicaragua about uh, TB clubs and support groups that were effective in reducing stigma. And I would call this if the first type of patient-centered care would be more uh, individual empowerment. I'd say that uh, TB clubs and support groups were, would more be some kind of um, collective empowerment, where also these uh, could take on some kind of activist uh, approach as well, where um, TB patients or former TB patients in those groups could actually educate the uh, rest of the their communities and uh, work as advocates for other people to be able to be efficient and also adhere to treatment and um, in general live um, a better social life. So they were or organizing um, just um, activities, group activities to do together, excursions and uh, other things because it's common for TB patients or in those contexts to uh, perhaps isolate themselves and not go out and stop with their their normal interests but they try to still help people living normal lives which were in some way empowering to, to yeah. Be. yeah and um, also in uh, healthcare workers and uh, caregivers Healthcare workers can, of course, also be um, victims of stigma, or um, some people don't like the word victim. But um, in this case, we only found uh, an intervention where they were considered to, imp oh, to improve the attitudes of healthcare workers and uh, towards TB patients. And uh, this uh, proved to this was a um, workshop of uh, to. It wasn't specified what it included exactly, but uh, it proved to be then uh, effective in healthcare workers, the general healthcare workers, but not in uh, DOTS workers. And this was in Taiwan. It was a small study. And uh, the result in the general community was effective. One campaign in Bangladesh uh, using mass education tools um, as a uh, yeah, l using loudspeakers because it was a rural area, um, showing stories of successful treatment, big film screenings, for example. But one thing that was interesting was it was one study with a community awareness raising approach and training in Nigeria by community volunteers. And even though the knowledge increased, um, questions that were regarded to how people view TB patients actually proved that or it showed that the stigma has increased significantly, significantly as well. So it's important to think that is it so that it might not be necessary that increasing the knowledge and awareness of TB might not be necessarily decreasing stigma mm -hmm. in a way with TB as it <coughs> might be doing more uh, the view would be with HIV for example um, and uh, some just a few conclusion a methodological <laughs> conclusion as well you saw there are very few uh, evidence based and published uh, interventions and uh, there are need of more interventions that are evaluated quantitatively or qualitatively um, and to see to get more um, inspiration to what works and what might not work and it's also encouraged to use standardized or validated instruments and uh, to uh, measure this because we looked at the quality of the studies and ranked the evidence and actually they were not very good so these are indicators but the the, t the way that these uh, studies were conducted would not really survive a uh, strong scientific scrutiny. Um, and often the, the qualitative, uh, qualitative studies that were kind of complementary to the quantitative, but the interesting results were in the qualitative studies, and then it would have been interesting if they were more elaborated and uh, more, um, maybe a <coughs> separate publication um, in themselves. Um, so that is uh, how we can 
perhaps there is some inspiration on how to move forward because uh, it's still obviously there is a dearth of evidence or so and there are so many other interventions as well that are not evaluated and those are of course really important too. I'm not saying that oh, it has to be <coughs> evidence based according to this and that but it's it's good when it comes to looking into the future and what to apply in other contexts. Thank you. Yeah. Is there yes. time for questions? Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, I was wondering for this these interventions with a methodology mm -hmm. in the planning phase, do they base the intervention on a health belief model or theory of planned behavior? Mm -hmm. Or do on, on what are the interventions based on scientific evidence or frameworks or not? Um, some might be, but some in so a lot of uh, most cases there's not really any background such as that. If there's a s quantitative study, they were more based on this scale might have been used in some context before. Um, or so, and the qualitative studies in general were quite short and or shortly described, and so it wasn't that much to um, judge when when you saw. And sometimes it might have been a, a, a great study, but it wasn't. Uh, um, there was not. It was not described, so it was hard to say. Unfortunately, you know what? Yeah. Hmm? Maybe I missed it, but how did you measure a reduction? <coughs> um, that was. Uh, so how did the studies measure? Yeah, they did it very differently. There were either um, uh, a randomized control, like a quasi uh, randomized uh, trial, you uh, using uh, scales. They were mainly using scales. Some of them, I think, uh, were using uh, mental health scale, uh, stigma scale that they just. Uh, uh, switched uh, the mental illness to stigma um, and uh, some were just asking a couple of questions some like a lot of studies there was a com they were different uh, they were simultaneously um, increasing knowledge and using s uh, stigma so it felt like they weren't that uh, more increasing attitudes so it wasn't that much elaborate focus on the, the measurement and the qualitative studies was just a couple of quotes maybe saying that before I suffered now I feel great um, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but they would be interested with more uh, background uh, <coughs> yes I'm sorry we, we have to move on Thanks. sorry so um, you wouldn't recognize her, I think, from this picture. But um, this is Ingrid, who also uh, will present now. She's from the Eastern Cape in South Africa. She contracted 3XDR in 2012. She completed two years of treatment. And today she's cured. And she's working at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. And we are um, very uh, glad that she's here to share her experiences with us. Yeah, good afternoon. Um also no conflict of interest. Um, basically just a short history, um, I have ulcerative colitis and I was treated with immune suppressants. So working in the government sector in the Eastern Cape is a high burden of TB, I'm sure you've heard, also of drug resistant TB. And then a month after I was treated for the ulcerative colitis, I contracted drug resistant TB and um, so they did a lung biopsy to diagnose me. And so in between we were waiting for the results, I was started on treatment already um, and the toxic regimen caused the liver failure. Um, I didn't realize I heard afterwards um, that the doctors saw me go um, deteriorating so the physician phoned my family to fly down, they stay in Victoria on coffee to come and say goodbye to me. Um, so when they came, I was hypertonic, uh, completely out of it. Um, my mom said she just heard me say, ma, ma, like a child would speak. Um, I 
can't remember these things, so it's not that for me, but I think for a family it's not nice to see. I'm also the youngest of three sisters, so for them it was tough as well. Um, fortunately, after three days, I, people were praying for me and I woke up and I'm fine. Um, no brain damage, the MRI showed, so I'm grateful for that. Um, during my hospital stay, the one support system that I really treasure was the support from the nursing staff and from my doctor. So they, um, the sisters would call me eight months. Hey, eight months, how are you? And I, um, at that time, people are so sensitive that it's actually refreshing if someone is just kind of, I am swollen like this. Let's just say it like it is rather, you know? <laughs> I do, it did look like I was eight months pregnant. So um, that was quite nice for me that they related to me like they would relate to anyone else. They teased me as well. Um, but they showed kindness also. Um, I said earlier today as well um, in another talk, something that touched me was they, they wash you in the, with the um, alcohol soap they watch everyone with that but the one sister brought um, soap from home that had a se it was scented so it was like oats flavor <laughs> and after she had bought me in the bed I felt so pretty for the first time in weeks I felt like I, I smell nice and <laughs> my hair was probably still dirty because I don't know if they ever washed it more than twice in that whole time I was in hospital but um, that was nice, and my doctor also, he was great, Dr. Stickles. He sat with me on the bed, and then I was depressed today. He didn't say, no, be positive. He just sat there. He just sat there and put his hand on my feet, and he sat there. And um, that helped. I don't know how. But you can imagine, um, for a patient, for a doctor to take half <coughs> a minute to sit with you, it's quite nice. And um, this is one of the sisters that was... She still sends me WhatsApps and, and she still teases me and we're still good friends. Um, they tried to get me to dress better because you kind of lose a sense of dignity. So they all remind her that no, you have to have <laughs> personal hygiene in a sense. So she was, she was there for me for that. And so after 75 days, I was discharged. And I thought it would be easy at home and um, it wasn't. I had lost my job and my freedom and my independence. So the social support during that time was obviously my husband after work, he would come and he would have to take me out of the bath and it was too weak to get out. So you're dealing with a very frustrated person now. I'm used to doing everything by myself, now I'm stuck in the flat. So if he came home half an hour later than it takes to drive from work, and um, there would be issues. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you lose perspective. Your world is very small. Um, noises, lights would, would irritate me and frustrate me. And also, I think I lost, I lost a, a sense of joy. I used to be spoiled. I woke up <coughs> feeling happy every day. Suddenly, you. you you don't feel like that. You, you feel like the opposite. Or you would wake up from nightmares from the hospital and you are crying. So the contrast is, uh, you're not yourself. You're a different person. That's the easiest way for me to describe it. And the treatment I was on was neuropathy. And luckily for me, I had doctors that trusted me and listened and you heard me out. I think some patients, because I'm a dietitian, I'm also a healthcare worker, I think you have, um, so you have uh, people give you the time of day. So when I went the first time, they, uh, the test showed I didn't have peripheral neuropathy. But the doctor said, it sounds like it, and you will give me the treatment because I was crying, my feet were on fire. And only a month or two later, it showed up on the test. So just because he had give, gave me the time of day, um, that changed my quality of life. And um, so I think giving someone time is also a sense of support. The treatment, oh, I had diarrhea three times a day from the past, um, vomiting, um, the injections, uh, abscess had to be drained. Um, so the support there is kind of, 
people accept you how you are. If you are in a mall and you are vomiting, um, just people being normal around you. You know, life happens. I think I, it reminds me if you see a mother with children who are just causing chaos. No one's judging her. They all feel like oh, it could be my children doing that, and um, and that taught me with TV, you know, for a patient in the hospital to, to be vomiting or to have diarrhea, and for um, any healthcare worker to come and be like, why didn't you just go to the bathroom? Now I have to clean this up. A patient, a patient doesn't choose to be. They want to be healthy, they want to be treated as a human. They don't want to be human, it's humiliating for them. And you don't have control over your body. Um, and I think, we, I think I was fortunate because I have family and friends who are very um, warm and kind. But I think the world can be quite harsh if you don't have that. And this was my medication that I had to take today. So I'm a dietitian. I refused to eat many days. I just drank supplements, 600 milk a day, and three doses with my medication. We had fights in the house. My mom said to me, if you had children, then you would have eaten. You are spoiled because you are just being stubborn. You get, reach a point where you feel, okay, God, come and fetch me. I'm ready to go now. And your family wants you to hang in there, but you kind of lose your will someday. So you really need people to encourage you all the way and um, family, communities, churches, any community that you can link your patients up with and can, can pull them through. Am I over my time? Okay. But you can, you can quickly go through okay. the last slides. Um, I think nature or hobbies, that's also a support you can give your patients <laughs> um, to, to remind them of things that they like, if they like music, to play music in the house or to tell the family to put dancing movies up and um, just to lift their spirits a little bit. My pharmacist drew pictures on my medication every month that made me laugh. You see, Ingrid is on top of the world and I would just say this. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> um, yo, I think I am grateful that now I realize the role of your family. I think you are put in a family and in a community for a reason and people shouldn't be proud. You must rather ask for help and patients should ask for help. It's not just the community's responsibility. People should, should ask for help. Um, coming from South Africa, I feel like the, I don't know how the poor survive it um, or the lonely um, people who don't have friends or family and people who are discouraged and th I think that's a gap where we can take initiative and go to those people, identify them early and um, to support them. Because um, not everyone needs the same amount of support like someone said earlier. Each person in each context is different. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry for <laughs>Thank you very much, Ingrid. So we, we are seeing this cascade of perspectives from the policy perspective to what science is telling us, but what can only the people who have passed through the experience of TV can tell us. Now we have Pumeza, also from South Africa, who is a survivor of MDRT and are going to share with us as well her experience of passing through that process. Thank you. Let's acknowledge the fact that TV is a priority and it's killing people every day, 18 seconds, and someone dies of TV. So in 2010, I was a university student in Cape Town. Um, I was just getting thin, I wasn't coughing, I wasn't, I wasn't experiencing a night sweat, like the normal TV symptoms, I was just getting thin. So I went to the private doctor and the, to test for normal uh, common diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, even HIV, they all came back negative. So he said I must go to the clinic to cough up his printer because the private doctor doesn't do that. So I went to the clinic, I coughed out. Even the TV results came back negative. There was no signs of TV. So the doctor saw that, you know, I'm, I'm dying because I was getting thin and I was losing energy. So he said I must go do a check surgery. And then I was diagnosed with TB from the check surgery because it was not normal. So I took the normal TB drugs for uh, for two months and I was not getting better. And then um, 
the results, I called them again, and the results came back, and they saw that it was actually MDR TB. I took the MDR TB drugs for about um, five, four months, and then I woke up one morning. You know, we woke up, we go to the bathroom. I woke up, I went to the bathroom, I flushed, there was no sound. I tried to turn on the tap to wash my hair, there was no sound. Okay, we problem drink, we problem not awake yet. So I went to the TV, <coughs> turn on the TV, volume was up, there was nothing coming out from the door. So I just, it was just a sound like a, which was not normal. So I went to the, to the nurse, and I told the nurse that I cannot hear. I saw her talking like moving her lips, <coughs> there was no sound coming out. So he then had to rope down that I must go to the audiologist, she had my ears tested. The audiologist wrote down um, in, a, in my folder, there was D-E-A-F, which means deaf, with the exclamation mark. <laughs> and then <laughs> he wrote down that I must go to my, uh, my doctor. And then the doctor explained that uh, the injection calamicin uh, made, my, made me deaf. So now I'm actually deaf. So when I was moved from the LGR to the pre xdr ward, I thought the tablets were, were not the same. They are the same, just that they, they add more. If you're taking 20 tablets, now you have to take 30. So they had to stop the injury, but I was not responding. While I was going through this, um, the family from France, although they didn't understand why they had to wear the mask, why they came to my room, well, it was really helpful. If you cannot hear each other, they would text WhatsApp, it was mixed back then, and there was a thing called to go. So we text, and then there was Facebook, it was nice. So I so saw like uh, pre XDR TV. So I went uh, in the pre XDR ward, they checked me out and they saw something unusual in my lungs. So they feared to make cancer. But then I was sent to in Cape Town Hotlisky Hospital. Well, it was not cancer, it was just some liquid building up in my lungs. Well, I did that and um, there were complications. While they were operating, they actually broke one of my ribs and punctured my lung, which ended up with two. They called me the part of medical staff. It happens, yes. Mistakes happen, that's what they say. But anyway, people will come in with friends and family. They will come in, say, telling me that I'll be fine, I'll be okay. But for some reason, I knew I might die because that was the reality at that point. But uh, those are the tablets that I was taking, they changed. There was a point whereby they, I had to choose which tablet they wanted to take. There were yellow tablets, they make you sick. They smell so badly, you vomit after taking them. I'm sure you know. If you're on a mic, <laughs> <laughs> uh, It was MGR. So I was discharged. I went back while I did the operation. I was getting better. So I was discharged to go at the clinic to continue my medication for pre XDR. And then, um, five, um, five, six, seven months later, the pre XDR drug stopped working. So now I was told I have XDR, which is like the final stage of TB. And uh, there were points where I, would, I was told three times that I would die and I should probably consult the priest like, to prepare my soul because there was no way I was going to make it. So they made me choose either I want to stop the medication or not. So anyway, I decided I want to gamble. So I played the dice and I took the medication. And um, I procured. MSF actually helped with the drug called Lizardit. And in 2013, uh, uh, after three years and three months of treatment, getting dead, being told I'm going to die, uh, going through surgery, um, I was cured from XDR, but then I was left there. Awkward, awkward, awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> so in last year, 2015, we did a fundraising for cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are very expensive. So because while I was still on treatment, I used to blog, but my experience, people knew me from the blogs. So um, we managed to raise 20,000 US dollars for one cochlear implants, and the other, uh, and the other half, well, we had to rob a bank to get <laughs> <laughs> So I have cochlear implants now. Not but people always ask me, um, how do they work? Like for instance, at the community common space, there's those things that we have to put in our ears. I can't put them because my ears are just here for display, they are not working. <laughs> I'm using cochlear implants. So what's happening is they cut you, they put whatever they put inside and then they close. And then you have to wait for three weeks to heal. And I was healing there. And the, I was there, completely there. I was still there. But then they had to write 
down that, the audiologists. Oh, another thing, I think the only people who understand what deafness is, is audiologists. Other people get impatient with me. Uh, for instance, in hospital, um, they wanted me to go to counseling. So they, they sent me to the counselor. So I didn't know maybe they didn't be with the counselor. So the counselor was talking. So I told her, no, I can't be up there. And she was still could be talking. I was like, no, I can't be up there. <laughs> like, okay, let's shout it. D-E-A-F, deaf, take a dictionary, Google it. <laughs> and um, I decided to cancel the whole thing because it was not working for me and for her. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's how it looks outside. So the, the news in South Africa were all over it because I think in my community I'm the only one who actually got my hearing back. I know people who were at the hospital I did not get the support I got from their friends and family. So when they went to weekend pass out, they won't come back. They committed suicide because it was, uh, it was, what, there's no life. I mean, you're there, you used to listen to music, you used to watch TV, you used to talk to people normally. What's the point of living? Because I had support, I managed to pull through. I read lots of books, lots of cars, many books out there. So, yeah. So there's the fixed the patent laws, like the drug that saved my life, called Benzoli. At the time, South Africa, it was very expensive. So I was at the right time, at the right place, which meant that uh, only 20 patients managed to get that drug from MSF, and the rest, they all passed away. And yeah, we were asking the Department of Trade and Industry to fix the patent laws. It was last year at the, in Paris. I was there, then, but I was talking about my experience. It was in 2013, the union at, in Paris. So we're asking the government uh, and the pharma companies to stop making uh, drugs, drugs very expensive. Like for them, it's people over profits, like it's profits for patients. So yeah, I think that is it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people have questions for you. I think you, you told a very impressive story, uh, but people may have still questions for both of you. I, I think my question for both of you is, you know, we've spent a lot of time in this session talking about how do we measure, how do we decide what to do, and my question to you is how, it, how important is that in your opinion? I think we all want to have evidence on which to base our decisions about what we do and not do. But to me, when I think about patient-centered care, we don't do it because we have evidence. We do it because it's the right thing to do. So I'm, I'm just wondering, from your perspective, how much longer do we have to wait to decide that providing individualized patient-centered care is the thing that we need to do? Um, can I answer? I think it's very important to do it within a scientific um, approach because people that make decisions want to see data, which is fair, um, if they want to invest. So I think it's just it's a way of drawing attention as well because we can say that we need this and that, but to have a basis for it, um, doing research won't prove what we are saying to be untrue. It's just it's. Um, strengthens it, I, th I think. But the pro I mean, the problem for me is how do we d how do we do research and try to group things that are ungroupable? If yeah. you're an individual, you need one thing. Somebody else needs something mm -hmm. completely different. So, I, I think s I, I agree that we we need evidence, but it's evidence on a very high level. It's not an evidence about what what is going to work for one individual. But maybe yeah. even showing that, like Nina said, if there were qualitative um, quotes where you can see, okay, there were 200 people in the same context, but their needs were completely different, that's proof too. Um, so I think, yeah, I think research has a place. But I do think that to, to take some things, <laughs> the um, Sort of systematic review is so difficult, and yeah. also what programs can be, because uh, it doesn't help to give everybody a full parcel, especially.
question because the food parcels are usually very basic yes. and people say, well, we never eat that at home. <coughs> so luckily I have a dog or a neighbor who needs it. <laughs> but uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't help to, to apply the, the one size fits all. It's certainly not for patient-centered care because it will not be patient-centered by definition. Yes. Yeah, so I think it, it helps if, I mean, you don't need to provide everyone the same package or uh, intervention and then measure the effect. That's not what we want. What we would like to see is that the uh, interventions are designed in a way that makes sense, so that they are designed based on a framework, based on talking to patients, based on... Um, what really seems to be needed on the ground and that may differ from context to context uh, and but as long as we can show that it really helps it doesn't i don't think we need to show what helps we need to show that it helps the package helps and it still will we will not be able to say what in the package is the most important thing uh, but i don't think that is what is needed but I agree that it makes it, it it's in, almost impossible to do it. But because many countries still depend on foreign uh, funding, they need to make budgets. It's yes. It goes down to sometimes very practical things. If you don't, if you cannot budget for it, or, or we need to know, maybe we need to do uh, some cost, cost collection uh, data for a group of patients and then it includes all different sort of care and then come up with some sort of an average yeah. to be practical and, and give tools to people making plans and budgets. Yes. Yeah, and I think what we should try is to work with the local governments to, to make it more sustainable and not so donor dependent and to make it, in su to develop in, in, in such a way that it, it is not dependent on global fund money uh, but that it will be taken up, that a, a system will be built in the country um, that the, that you know all patients can rely on, even when you know the global fund disappears or uh, within global fund there they decide not to uh, to uh, give any money for food packages, for example. Yeah, there is one question over there. Questions, comments? We we'll probably need to leave the room for the next pack if there is any. Or you may have other plans. But anyway, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the speakers and especially for you, Pumetsa and Ingrid, for sharing your experiences. I think there is a lot of work to do. Something that is fundamental is that there is a policy framework that is in the making and that has to be used when you go to support countries just to make of this not an option but just a must as part of the responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.